fabulous tour that we're going to have tomorrow. But now she's going to talk to us about finding face in the largest library in the world. Wow. <laughs> Hi. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you hear me all right? Because it's a good, because that's working great. So, um, and I know you'll forgive the glasses because I cannot, even the 14 point, I can't read this <laughs> without them. So, so I'd just like to introduce myself. I'm the reference specialist for religion um, in the main reading room at the Library of Congress. And I, I work primarily with um, materials 1801 and after in English and the Romance languages. Is it, you can't, is it? Yeah. Let's see, is that a little bit better? Yeah. Okay, better. good, good. And thankfully, um, I am not alone in, in dealing with the religion collections of the library because it's a huge place and there's no way I could even know all of the general collections. So thankfully, I have colleagues in the Asian division who work with Tibetan collections. I have colleagues in Hebraic collections and colleagues in all the various reading rooms that, that know so much about the, the Library of Congress religion collections. Um, there's no way I can tell you everything that is there, but I hope to give you some idea of the highlights of the collections and, um, and the strengths, particularly in religion. During this talk, I'm going to mention some of those strengths. Don't worry about catching it all or even feeling like you have to write it down because the handout that, that's going around has links and there's quite extensive um, descriptions of the collections, much more extensive than I will go into um, on some of those links. So you can read all about the rare book collections or the manuscript collections if those are particularly of interest. And I'm just going to touch along the top of those things. Um, also, uh, first let me start too with your day tomorrow because I know that you're, you're coming to the library. And um, I think it's going to be a very good day. I know most of the people that will be giving you tours, and they're they're just all they're all great and very interesting. So um, tomorrow you're going to start with the main reading room, and you'll you'll start and see this glorious, glorious room, and get a chance to learn a little bit about the art and architecture, but also just how it works there. You know, how does somebody do research there? Um, and then after that. You'll visit some of the behind the scenes um, sections of the library and the various reading rooms and also I think preservation. So you'll see some of those things. And what I think is kind of neat is that you're not all going to the same place because then you can come back and tell each other about what you've learned. And, and I think that, that'll be very interesting for you. Um, you know what, I, I clicked this and I thought, why isn't the picture changing? I have to turn the page. <laughs> What does that show you, that I'm a little nervous? Maybe that's what it is. So, um, we don't want that. Hang on just a second. So in preparation, let me tell you a little bit about the history of the Library of Congress. You may not know how it is that we came to have books on every topic imaginable, including so many of the religions of the world. Um, the library that you'll see was built in 1897. Uh, but the original library was created in 1800 and consisted of books ordered from London, about 740 books, three maps, and um, they were mostly legislative materials um, necessary for the work of Congress, and they were housed in a small room on the west end of the Capitol building. And then in 1814, oops, I seem to be doing something here, sorry, it, during the War of 1812, um, the Capitol was burned, and along with it, the collection of the library was burned, the Congressional Library. Um, so this is a this is a picture, an image of what the Capitol looked like after after the burning. Um, after the war and the fire, Congress was in need of a new library, and Thomas Jefferson was in need of funds. He did like wine. I'm sure he liked other things too, but um, he needed funds. So he offered his own personal library as a substitute for the destroyed collection. And his, his collection was the largest personal library in the country. Um, he offered this as a replacement for the lost collection. And it reflected his tastes, his broad interests, both practical and intellectual, and his love of learning and, and 
Um, and it included books in many languages on a myriad of topics, including zoology, philosophy, religion, music, and beekeeping. Really, the whole, there really wasn't much he was not interested in. There was sharp debate about this in Congress, about the wisdom of purchasing Jefferson's library as a replacement for the destroyed contents of the Library of Congress. And some congressmen thought, you know, why do we need books in other languages and on beekeeping and <laughs> on all of these other topics? Why do we need this kind of crazy collection? I mean, they, you, they've come from something that was just legal, and here is a scholar's collection. And Jefferson had anticipated this concern, and he argued famously that there is no subject to which a member of Congress may not have occasion to refer. Mm -hmm. So that's, that finally won them over. And in the end, Congress agreed to purchase the books, 6,487 6, volumes for $23,950, which is about $334,000 in our today's dollars. Jefferson had the book shipped in crates, which doubled as bookshelves, so the collection could be kept in the same order that he had them on his own shelves um, in, his, in his library. Then he started to work on a new library, I think. His organization scheme was memory, which is history, reason, philosophy, and imagination, fine arts. Uh, Jefferson provided the Congress with a complete inventory of his library, and of course he kept a copy of the inventory for himself. And if you're looking for where his religion was, it's, it's entered under um, philosophy or reason. So 10 wagon loads of books arrived at the Capitol, forever changing the tenor of the Congressional Library collection. To this day, we are the only national library collecting both comprehensively and internationally. And Jefferson's collection is actually on exhibit at the library. Um, there are a number of exhibits, and off the Great Hall on the second floor, um, there is a sort of spiral with his collection, but those books are used. If someone says, I'd like to look at Jefferson's Quran, they go get the book out of that exhibit and they bring it to the rare book collection. So those books are used. So sadly though, a uh, second fire on Christmas Eve, 1851, burned two thirds of the library's 55,000 volumes, including 4,000 of Jefferson's original collection. It was late on Christmas Eve, and the fire was started by a small heater. So because of that, almost no one was at the library or at the Capitol. And in response, Congress voted a massive appropriation to replace the lost books, plus funds to construct a series of rooms in the Capitol designed for the exclusive use of the library. And this time, the Congress took no chances. They built a fireproof room to house the library, which consisted of about 18,000 volumes. The, the books that survived that fire. In the next 40 years, a number of important changes occurred, growing the collection to 210,000 volumes. First, copyright came into the Library of Congress for the first time, and formally, copyrighted books either went to the State Department or to district courts. And this had an enormous effect on the collections, as you can imagine, and it still does today, because we still read receive an enormous amount of our books through the copyright system. Um, another development was that the Smithsonian Institutes transferred their entire 40,000 volume collection to the Library of Congress, which ended a rivalry between the two. And they, the library purchased a major collection that established the library's Americana and Infinabula collections, and they also sort of formalized their um, collection of books and documents from foreign countries. And finally, it was agreed that a separate building would be built to house the burgeoning collections. And that is the building that you'll see tomorrow, the Jefferson Building. Um, there are some beautiful photographs in our digitized prints and photographs collection of this. This is, um, this is a particularly beautiful lunette in the, in the Great Hall, and it's meant to represent religion. You'll see um, it's it's really a beautiful thing. They're, they're worshiping fire, I think, but it's just a, it's a gorgeous um, design. So the building was completed ahead of schedule and under budget in 1897. How <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't happen too often, I'm not sure it could happen again, but it happened. 
And so what was the amount? It was $6 million. And it's amazing to think <laughs> that there were no funds designated for sculpture or paintings or artistic enrichment. And when you see the building, you won't quite believe that. But what happened was they realized they were kind of on target for the budget. And so they thought, oh, let's jazz this place <coughs> up. And they decided, General Casey and Bernard Green decided to create a cultural monument. And that, that is really what it is. And I think they were also kind of competing with the, the National Libraries of, of Great Britain and other places that have just extraordinary libraries. So materials were moved from the Capitol by ox-drawn carts to the new Jefferson Building, which is really just across the street. And although there was clearly a lot of sorting to do, one of the reasons we have such incredible collections is that we don't throw anything away. It's kind of a problem, actually. <laughs> the Jefferson Building was intended to contain the collections until 1950, and of course, Congress had no way of knowing about what the publishing industry was going to be doing, and it was filled to capacity by 1910. We now have two other buildings. It doesn't really look like that anymore, <laughs> I'm happy to tell you. Um, we have two other buildings on Capitol Hill, the, Jeffer the Madison and the Adams. We have off-site storage. We are still bursting at the seams. And it's, it's, it's such a problem, actually, that we've recently had to, we used to take two copies of books, but now we are starting to just take one because we cannot, it's gotten to a crisis where the floors will be too heavy. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a crisis. Um, so that, that's how that's working. And now to tell you a little bit about the collections themselves. They can be found in 20 different reading rooms and they include 130 million items. We receive 10,000 things every working day. Oh. Yeah, that's why it knocks your socks off, doesn't it? It's a good thing I'm wearing sandals. <laughs> the, um, it, now that could be a book, it could be a piece of sheet music, it could be a piece of microfilm, it could be anything, it could be a map. Because we have things in every format, but that's sort of the number, the working number that, that they go with, and I think it's probably, probably true. So it's a huge place, but one that we really want people to use. It's not meant to just for Congress. That's probably, when we have open houses, um, at the library twice a year, we do this on Columbus Day and on President's Day, where we let anybody who wants to come in with baby carriages and all the cameras they want. And that is probably the question that we get asked the most. You mean I could come here? And if, if I could get any word out, that would be it, that everybody is welcome to use that library. So let me just tell you a little bit of how it's organized. So there's 20 different reading rooms, and they're organized in three different kind of general um, organizational um, modes. So there's geographic region, which is like the Hispanic, the European, the African, Middle East, the Asian division, those are the, the geographic areas. There are subjects like law, business, science. The main reading room is actually humanities and social sciences. And by format, like um, prints and photographs, rare books, manuscripts, and so those, those are the, the different ways. And really, you can find religion in just about any one of them, as you well imagine, because I think most of you come from places where you have all kinds of topics, as, as well as, as like we do. So let me just start with um, some of the geographic regions. So this is the Asian division, and I don't know if any of you recognize that, but what that is in the front is a Tibetan prayer wheel. And if you go to Tibet, you'll see a rows of them and people walk by they just spin them and the prayers get spun it's a beautiful idea so that that's the Asian division that covers uh, China Japan Korea and South Asia with particular emphases on Buddhism Taoism Confucianism and Hinduism including the sacred texts in the vernacular commentaries on these texts and secondary sources and I'll just mention a couple of highlights because what I don't want to do to you is just read a list of things, and I'll try, I'll try not to do that. But they, the Japanese collections contain approximately 5,800 titles on Buddhism. And among the Japanese section's rare book materials, a collection of Buddhist scrolls from the 8th century AD. The Tibetan collection contains comprehensive holdings of Buddhist canonical literature, Kanjur and Tanjur, and commentaries dating from the 8th century AD to the present. 
the African and Middle Eastern reading room. This, this, this reading room houses um, the books in the vernacular for the Arab and Islamic world and Judaism, as well as specialists for the area, uh, these areas and Africa. We have a number of overseas offices which purchase materials for us, and this would be true for any of the, um, well, it's really true for all of the reading rooms, but it's most evident, I think, for some of these geographic areas, which means that we get, um, we get a wide range of viewpoints. You know, it'll, it'll be Islam, but it'll be from many, many different viewpoints and many different groups of um, Islamic um, peoples. And, um, and I think that that adds a lot to the collections. And so the scope is very wide ranging in viewpoint. <coughs> Just to touch on a few areas for this division, um, researchers coming to the Near East Division are able to find materials to do in-depth and extensive research in their area of Islam both in classical and modern materials, and the library has a huge collection vast in the Quran. This includes manuscripts of the Quran, facsimiles, translations, um, tafsir or commentaries, and studies about the Quran in both books and articles in many languages. You can also find here um, materials in Persian, Turkish, Armenian, and Georgian, Coptic materials, and um, just to say again, if you have extra time in DC, there is a Persian exhibit at the library just behind the Jefferson collection. And it includes some of the highlights of the religion collections for Persia, the Persian materials. So it's a beautiful collection. I think it's there through September. So feel free to stop by for that. This um, reading room also has the Hebraic section. And um, there's about 150,000 volumes in Hebrew, Yiddish, and Ladino and related languages dating from the 16th century to the present. The Hebraic section's holdings are especially strong in the areas of Bible, rabbinics, liturgy, and responsa, along with extensive collections of the Passover Haggadah. Um, and the library's collections of Africana materials from or relating to Africa are among the best in the world. American Folk Life. This is one of the, one of the options for tomorrow, and I, I see that it's already filled up, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, the American Folklife Center in the library was created by the U.S. Congress in 1976 and charged to preserve and present American folklife. And the center incorporates the library's archive of folk culture, which was founded in 1928, as a repository for American folk music. The archive is America's national archive of traditional life, and it's unlike any other reading room at the library. Its collections are eclectic and really fascinating. I mean, I think. One of the things it's known for is music, but it, it's got um, all kinds of, of other things. I think just about the time that the, um, the war in Iraq started, I started finding little plastic soldiers um, in the metro. And, and I brought a couple of those into folk life, and they said, oh yeah, we want these. Because they want anything that reflects the culture of the time where we are for America. So. And let me just mention a few things, just to give you a sense for the, um, the range of things they have there. They have recordings of Hopi religious music and ceremonies, interviews about Jewish festivals and religious customs with songs and Ladino in English, tapes of Pentecostal religious services, songs and interviews, including snake handling services, and they've got audio and video of those, recordings of African-American church services made in Mississippi and Tennessee in 1942. So a lot of these things are very, snapshot-like in the sense that they will give you an idea of what the culture was in a particular place at a particular time. Mormon songs and stories recorded in Utah in 1948, uh, recordings of Russian Orthodox church songs in 1941, and I did note that there was two discs that, uh, containing an interview with Harold Wood, a Seventh-day Adventist missionary doctor in Alaska, 1941, and um, I don't know how available I don't know whether they'll mention that tomorrow or not, but I thought that was that was interesting. So that was the picture that was wanted to go with that. <laughs> Humanities and Social Science, that's the division that I work in, and it's the home of the main reading room. And it's really your portal to the general collections and the books on religion in that area, or really any books, 1801 and after. So these collections in English, the Romance languages and Cyrillic expand and support the collections for the format and geographic regions so that the African and Middle East will have incredible Islamic collections and then we'll have the English and the 
French and the German books in, about Islam in the general collections. We cover all the religions of the world with particular strengths in Christianity, Eastern Orthodoxy, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, and the sacred, sacred texts and religious history of the United States. We have excellent American sectarian collections, including histories, biographies, annual reports, journals, pamphlets, and sermons. And having just spoken about the strengths in American sectarian um, groups, I have to also say that in pretty much all cases, while we have, I would, I think, good, very good collections, um, any denominational um, university or college is gonna have better collections than we do. They're gonna be deeper and richer. And just a case in point, when I was searching seven-day Adventists in our catalog, I got about 1,900 results and about 240 titles by Ellen G. White. And I thought, well, that's not bad. Um, and then I searched Andrews University. That was, <laughs> and I didn't, I don't know, I didn't know Andrews was so large, but, because uh, it was just at the top of the list, and I said, let me just try this. And I found over 21,000 books on Seventh-day Adventists <laughs> and 4,000 by Ellen G. White, and so you blew us right out of the water. <laughs> <laughs> so our strength is not that we're gonna have better collections than you. Our strength is that we are going to have decent collections in all the different groups, and then the supporting work, the historical, the cultural, the economic, in the different formats and books that supports research in that time period. So that's really, that's really what the strength is there. And then finally, let me tell you a little bit about some of the, um, the format of collections. So the Rare Book and Special Collections Divisions owns approximately 43% of all books known to have been published in America before 1801. So they take care of all the other stuff. And by the very nature of publishing at that time, a great deal of it deals with religion. And the geographical strengths really are America and Europe. Um, there's so much in Rare Books that, that's amazing, just, just by its nature. I have a, I have a friend who's who's doing a detail up there now, and she, because sometimes they're doing a display or something, and she said, would you like to hold the Bay Songbook? And I said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's just so amazing. So let me just mention a few of, of the highlights there. They have an astonishing Bible collection, 1,471 titles, and that's 15th century, the 20th century, and 150 different languages, and that, those statistics are really from a while ago, so it's probably more by now, which includes the only Bible authorized by Congress, the first polyglot Bible from 1517, the Elliott Indian Bible, the first Bible to be printed in America in 1663, 50 miniature Bibles, and also the Gutenberg and the Giant Bible of Mainz. And the Gutenberg and the Giant Bible of Mainz are actually on display in the Great Hall. And I don't know if you know about the connection between them. They're both done in about in the book 1450. One is, of course, movable type, and the other is, is script, um, written by scribes, and they look very symbol, similar, sort of the way I suppose a Kindle and our books, you know, look similar, the same kind of thing. Um, they've got, their Incunabial collection encompasses nearly 5,700 items, it's the largest in the Western Hemisphere. They have a wonderful Reformation and Luther collection, over 400 imprints by Luther, Calvin, Johann Eck, Melanchthon, and others, primarily from the 16th century. They have a very good Christian Science Mary Baker Eddy collection. 325 titles received through copyright and as gifts um, on the founding of Christian Science. Harry Houdini's collection is up there, and that actually is, has a lot to do with um, spiritualism. They've got a good Mormon collection, very early, very complete set of early editions of the Book of Mormon, and that's actually one of the things that gets asked for very, very often. Mormons going through town want to see the first edition that they've got up there, even though they, they have digitized it, but they like to see their up there. We have a Shaker collection, one of the largest in the world, and uh, a Spanish-American collection of missionary tracts, records, and accounts. Geography and map. Um, it's hard to identify just what is religion in specifically in geography map. There's there's about four and a half million maps, but they do have those that would be easy to identify are about 18 drawers of maps of the Bible lands and 12 drawers of maps 
on the books of the Bible dating through the 20th century. Many of these were produced by missionaries for their work or for pedagogical purposes or regular Sunday school uh, or regular school classes. And these could be really used to study the trends in Christian scholarship or missionary movement. Of special note in this division is the first Hebrew map of Jerusalem and Ptolemy's <laughs> Atlas of the Holy Land. <laughs> What's interesting about some of the ones that they've digitized is that um, you can see lots of interesting ones. And this is, this is a, a kind of a funny one in that it's a square and stationary earth um, from 1893. Uh, this is by Professor Orlando Ferguson. So he supported this with Bible verses that the, the earth is square. And what's, what's kind of cool about the digitized collections is that you can zoom in and zoom it in a way that you really couldn't if the map was right in front of you. And so he, this little illustration of how he thinks this would be impossible for us to be flying around, we'd just flip right off the earth. Prints and photographs, another format collection. Um, they have photographs, drawings, and other images, as well as posters plans and cartoons. And one of my favorite collections in prints and photographs is the uh, Farm Security Administration um, photographs from the Office of War Information. So these are hundreds of black and white photographs of church buildings, religious services and meetings, artifacts, Salvation Army work, itinerant preaching, revivals, ceremonies. It's really a, an incredible snapshot of the United States in the 1930s and 40s. The Manuscript Division, um, they have a lot dealing with religion. So they've got, um, you can see there, I think, how did they, uh, well, you're going to manuscripts tomorrow, I'll let them tell you about some of the strengths okay. there, but they have um, organizations and as well as people. So they've got the American Sunday School Union, the National Council of Jewish Women, the Moravian Church Records, a lot of these organizational um, records as well as the papers of particular um, preachers and religious figures like Henry Ward Beecher, Dwight Moody, Reinhold Niebuhr, and William Jennings Bryan. Performing arts covers music, dance, and theater. There's approximately 33,000 titles listed on the online catalog under the subject headings church music and sacred vocal music. The collection is strong in texts of and works about Christian vocal music, masses, oratorials, cantatas, and hymns. Um, and among the division's unique resources are a considerable collection of published editions of early black gospel music. We also work in collaboration with other organizations or other institutions to digitize things. And this is one of my favorites, which I have to show you. Um, it's a digitized song, sheet piece of sheet music. I never knew I had a wonderful wife until the town went dry. And uh, what's great is that if you want to learn this, the music is all digitized. It's all there for you. So get your piano out. <laughs> Along with um, visiting the reading room, some of the things that you could do online um, are visit some of the exhibits. We've had a number of exhibits over the years that relate to religion. This um, screen is for the Bible collection. Um, and whenever they have an exhibit, they take images of whatever was in the exhibit so that you can see those things and read about them and see what the curator said about them. So that is always up there. And I think on your sheet, I've listed quite a number. I'm just noting a couple here. This one I refer people to a lot, the religious beginnings in America, because people are often asking about about that, and it's a great place to get some history. And here's one on the Jewish, Jewish life in America. So who can use our collections? All you have to be is 16 or older and curious. So I think all of you, all of you can come. <laughs> and so what kind of questions do I get? Uh, like you, I probably get some I get some funny questions. I'm sure you do too. Like, what color was the sky on the day of the flood? And I think, well, the Bible doesn't really talk about the sky color, so I'm not sure what to say. And someone recently said, um, asked for the original Sanskrit version of the Torah. 
That was, <laughs> that was a hard one too. It's sometimes it's like, how do you diplomatically say, I don't, I don't think there is one. <laughs> I've looked at World Cat. I've not been able to find it. <laughs> but more often, I get um, researchers of all ages and all faiths or no faith. Um, looking for things like um, the changes in devotional literature for teens from the 1920s through the 1960s or 80s. That was fascinating. Somebody who wanted sermons showing how the Great Awakening led to the American Revolution. I had a fascinating researcher looking at the current literature showing the effect of immigration from the Global South on the churches in North America, both theology, the um, seminaries, and and churches themselves, I'm sure you're quite aware of some of those things. Or writings by Southern white ministers on the subject of slavery from 1830 to the Civil War. And I love what I do because you never know what people will ask you, as you, as you know if you're reference. And I also like being in a non, you know, it's, I'm not in a seminary, so which means somebody might come up and ask me about the history of ketchup. And so it's, ni it's, it's a nice balance. <laughs> So you can come in from home and do a great many things through our website. Um, you can look at our catalog, you can look at our digitized collections, um, and you have a chance with our Ask a Librarian. You can ask any of the specialists questions about their collections or whether it's, you know, if things can be found there. And so there's information for researchers and librarians. So you can find out more about the reading rooms through their web pages or um, how to use the library. Um, and as librarians, there are sections that are of special interest to you as librarians. Um, but there's so much that isn't digitized, and a lot of it you can find through the catalog, but it, it's also speaking to the specialists is, is a great way because not everything, not everything, unfortunately, is in the catalog. So I hope that you will, my contact information is on that sheet. I hope that you will always feel free to contact me by email or phone. If, even if the topic you're interested in is not religion, I'm happy to be your easy gateway into this, into the Library of Congress. Um, thank you very much. questions, I'm happy to answer them, and I will see you tomorrow, too, so if something bubbles up, um, I will see you then. Yes, sir. What are you basically digitizing, and like, what is the rate of like titles or content that is being digitized? Um, we're, we are digitizing for the most part, it's things like prints and photographs or manuscripts. Those are some of the easy things. And those are decided usually by the division itself. And for books, we've been working with the Internet Archive and I think the Sloan Foundation. We've been digitizing books before 1922 um, because they're in the public domain. And I think the biggest focus was probably on American history and genealogy, but it, there were other things as well. So. There were teams of people going through the collections looking for the older materials and then making sure they were stable enough to be digitized. But there's a little digital center, actually. And the rate, I really don't know the rate. And it may be that if you're, if some, somebody I think is going to one of the sessions tomorrow about digitizing, maybe you can ask that there. <coughs> Any other questions? Yes. Just know, you mentioned that uh, you have the largest Incunabio collection in the Western Hemisphere. Who has a larger one? And second question, what was your career path? How does one get your job? What were your, what were your, what were your credentials? How did you end up there? I don't know the answer to the Incunabio question. And someone in Rare Books, I'm sure, could tell you. My career path is odd. And, you know, it's one of those in the right place at the right time things. Um, I. When I got out of the library, I, was a, I have a BA in religion. I do not have a PhD or a master's, and you know, please don't, nobody like trip me as I go out, because I'm sure you're all more qualified for my job. And when I, I started the Library of Congress as a temporary, and I really wanted to go there simply because 
the person who was the head of the reading room also taught at Catholic University where I went to school and I used to feel better when I left the class than when I arrived and I thought I think I need to work for her because I feel really good around her and I like the way she works and so I started as a temp and I kept getting more temps and I finally got a permanent job and then the person who was doing religion left and I said can I do that <laughs> so I, I I wish I had some fascinating way that I got here, but it's just an accident. Yes? What kind of relationship does Elsie have with Smithsonian, you know, like within regard to folk life center? Do you share any collections? You know, I, I don't know that they share, but I would guess they talk to each other a lot um, just because of the nature of their work. And I would ask the folk life, you know, I'm sorry, you know, the place is so big that I sometimes won't know about something like that because it's another reading room or another division. So are you going to folk life tomorrow? Yeah, definitely ask them that because they, they can tell you the answer. I apologize, I don't know. Yes? Do you have any materials on South Pacific or Oceania religions? I'm sure that we do. I would have to, um, I would have to take a look and see. Um, I think some of that would be found um, in the Asian division, and some of that would be in the general collections, and it would be a matter of having to search in our catalog or maybe talk to some of the specialists in um, the Asian division to find out more about that. And if you are particularly interested in that, please feel free to contact me and we can, we can take a look together on that. Anybody else? Yes. The question was asked about the Smithsonian. To what extent does the Library of Congress collaborate with the National Archives? Um, obviously, there's, there's, in some ways, they're quite separate, and yet, with the manuscripts collection, there'd be a degree of overlap. So, is is this a kind of formal channel for for communicating, or is it more informal? My guess is it's, it's informal because the National Archives really is records. It's the records of our government, and the manuscript division are the papers of people and organizations. And um, there is some connection in the fact that the Library of Congress has the papers of, I think, 23 presidents. And then, of course, the National Archives has the presidential libraries. And so I would guess that that is the strongest place where there's a, where there's a connection between the two. Yes, sir. My my question is, as a cataloger, 20 years ago when I entered the librarian profession, I would do OCLC searches, and I was amazed that a lot of the 19th century religious, popular religion books in America were not on OCLC yet. Mm. I could find them by, even before then, I'd find them by going to your card catalog, but I was looking yeah. for some of these uh, you know, rarely housed anywhere else type of books, popular religion. And you published. found them in the card catalog and, yeah. and you were able to get to our card The American Tract Society has published things. And just six weeks ago, I bought an American Tract Society book from 1860s. Mm -hmm. It's nowhere else. Wow. It's never been cataloged. And so how much <laughs> out there are we missing from 19th century? It's hard to say. Because it's hard to say. Unless I mean, it pops up, you don't know it's missing. Exactly. And we, I mean, I just think sometimes about what the, Darwin and his wife used to read to each other every night, and they wrote down the name, numbers of the names of the books, and those books don't exist anymore. Wow. Uh, um, and so I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I know that we used to have a rule that we didn't collect things under 50 pages. So that, you know, yeah. sometimes yeah. tracts, religious mm -hmm. tracts, sermons, and that is not true all across the board because we have lots of tracts and small things, thank goodness, because they're so reflective of times. I don't, so in a sense you're asking why, why didn't all the old stuff get into OCLC? Right. And I don't know the answer to that. Is it pretty complete now? as far as you know, for catalog records. OCLC? Yeah, OCLC records. Are you gonna be in the ABA talk tomorrow with Susan Morris? 
she probably I'll try and make it there. She is the one who probably would okay. know the answer to that. Good. She's amazing. Good. And she would know. She's also she knows the sort of cataloging behind the scenes and as a reference librarian, I don't know some of those things. Okay. So I apologize. There are some things I just I don't know about them. Anything else? You mentioned that you get 10,000 items per day. Do you catalog all of them, or is there a rule that you think you do not? They, um, some of those things go into what we call minimal level cataloging, and they will get author title. I don't think they get subject headings, and they don't get a call number. Um, those, I think, would be things more like foreign poetry or you know that kind of things. <coughs> scholarly things should get cataloged. Um, and I, it, we do a lot of copy cataloging. I'm sure you do as well, as well as original. But there's just so much out there, and we've had crutchet, um, crutchet butts. Um, <laughs> we've had those, just like you, budget cuts, just like you. And so we don't have the love, we don't have as many catalogers and folks to do all the work. And, the, and some of the um, language specialization that's necessary. Oh no, you could if you you could absolutely because it'll be it'll be cataloged um, with author title. So and it will have a number. It just won't be an A to Z Library of Congress number. So most of that is cataloged, but there's obviously a backlog. Yes, hi. What happens to the items then that you don't actually put in to the collection? What happens to those? Mm. They go to surplus, and then I think a number of things happen to them. One, we do exchange with other um, uh, countries because we do um, we get things from their governments or their country. Their country. We also make them available to libraries. Um, so, again, if you're interested in finding out about surplus, how that works, um, if you send me an email or leave me a phone message, I w I will find out how it could work for you if you wanted to do work with that collection. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to find out, do your books circulate? And if they do, what can I do to borrow a book from them? <laughs> <laughs> they circulate on interlibrary loan. They circulate to Congress, and they circulate to staff. So um, yes, if you wanted to get something through interlibrary loan, you absolutely could borrow something Let's say, um, like residents of, of Washington, D.C. area, mm -hmm. they can borrow residents, not necessarily. No, residents of D.C. cannot borrow. It's only interlibrary loan through yeah. that way. And so, and if, if you're a resident of D.C., they would probably want you to come in and use the library, use the collection there rather than taking it away. Although I think that does happen sometimes. And, um, so it's usually Congress, that interlibrary loan, Congress, and library staff. But other than that, it's not a circulated collection. It's really a research collection. Great. Well, thank you. It's been a real pleasure to talk to you. And I'm looking forward to seeing you tomorrow. I'm also, there's so much fun stuff that I'm going to hang around and <laughs> go through, um, through tours this afternoon. So thank you very much. Okay.